Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me again here on the True Crime Grapple Show. I'm your host Dan and this is episode 18. Now clearly on a true crime podcast you usually hear about the big topics such as murder, serial murder, rape or crimes against children and they of course are fascinating. But today I wanted to look at a case I discovered while doing a bit of research and it's a crime I think is taken fairly lightly at least until very recently. I'm talking, of course, about stalking. Stalking is one of the most frequently experienced forms of abuse. It is insidious and terrifying and can escalate to rape and murder. We need to treat stalking with the seriousness it deserves. There are many misconceptions about what stalking is about. It's not romantic, it is about fixation and obsession. It is a crime and it destroys lives. Now this is a fairly old statistic, but I wanted to throw it out there for a bit of perspective. This comes via the 2004 British Crime Survey. Over 1.2 million women are stalked every year. And think about that, and that stat is before cyber stalking became a thing. While you mull over that alarming stat, let's get our housekeeping out of the way for the day. Our social media, our Facebook and Instagram is at True Crime Grapple. Our Twitter is at TCG3682. And our Patreon page, if you'd like to make a pledge and help the show out a little, is at www.patreon.com slash Grapple. So check that out and pledge what you can. Right, that's all done and out of the way. So let me tell you another few stats. Number one. Many stalkers don't stop until their victim takes drastic evasive action. Number two, stalking often ends up in the death of the victim. And number three, stalking is a significant cause of suicide. This case is an eye-opener, and if those very few statistics on stalking don't open your eyes to what the seriousness of it is, then this story surely will. The show today is written and narrated by me, Dan Kelton. Music and editing is by Baba Beats. And it's time now for your fix. So lock the door, sit back and relax because it's true crime time. Ever had that feeling when you close your curtains at night? Or when you walk from your car to your door that you're being watched? Ever had someone random you don't know like or leave a comment on a picture on your Facebook? How often do you brush it to one side and not give it so much as a second thought as you close your curtains to the world or get inside your house and lock the door or log off your phone or computer for a while? But what if you were to look a little bit deeper? Would it alarm you to find out that someone is out there? Perhaps in the bushes across from your house? Watching? Studying? Waiting for any sort of movement? The merest jerk of that curtain might be enough to satisfy their need on that night. Perhaps in their warped mind, it might be seen as some kind of acknowledgement or signal. What if a loved one or a friend came to you saying they'd been on the receiving end of weird phone calls with no one talking on the other end? Or having the feeling they were being followed? Or coming home to find the china plate that had been in the family for generations has been disturbed from its usual spot? Would you do the dutiful thing as a friend and just listen and then reassure? Or would alarm bells go off in your head and you knew major concern needed to be had? What if strange feelings of someone watching along with strange phone calls, perhaps notes from an unnamed author, and weird text messages kept constantly happening, day after day, week after week, month after month? Imagine hearing your phone go off, It's a text message. You open it to see an untraceable number. And your heart drops because you know that when you open this message, you're going to feel fear. 
Imagine having just gotten out of an abusive relationship. Your ex won't let you go. They call you at work multiple times per day and then at night when you leave work, they follow you. Sure, you can call police and get a restraining order put on them, but does it stop the emails, the texts and the letters? Can it make you feel safe? Unfortunately, this isn't always a deterrent. In fact, it can often do the opposite. Stalking type behaviours can at first glance seem normal and ordinary. However, when they are repeated they can become menacing and cause alarm and distress to the victim. When seen in context, they are usually sinister and constitute harassment. Irrespective of whether a victim experiences significant alarm and distress, the motivation behind stalking is always sinister and often displays criminal intent. Stalking is a crime of power, control and intimidation. Stalking in any form, irrespective of the typology and or motivation, is abhorrent and an infringement of the victim's fundamental human rights. Some noted mental health professionals believe that stalkers can be treated given the right context. However, it is difficult to persuade most stalkers to undergo psychological or psychiatric analysis as they don't believe they are doing anything wrong. The stalker's view of reality is typically so distorted that they see themselves as lone heroic figures spurned lovers or wronged employees battling for justice. Any reaction to the unwanted abusive advances of a stalker only provides gratification to the stalker and thus serves to reinforce the stalking behaviour. It's hard to determine exactly when the first cases of stalking actually occurred, although it's probably safe to say that it goes back pretty far and would have been linked to the sex trade. As prostitution goes way back, we're looking at quite the time span. Having been used since at least the 16th century to refer to a prowler or a poacher, the term stalker was initially used by the media in the 20th century to describe people who pester and harass others initially with specific reference to the harassment of celebrities by strangers who were described as being obsessed. The use of the word appears to have been coined by the tabloid press in the United States and with time, the meaning of stalking changed and incorporated individuals being harassed by their former partners. Stalking can be defined as the willful and repeated following, watching or harassing of another person. Unlike other crimes, which usually involve one act, stalking is a series of actions that occur over a period of time. The psychology of stalking is fascinating, but at the same time, terrifying. Rejected stalkers follow their victims in order to reverse correct or avenge a rejection. Resentful stalkers make a vendetta because of a sense of grievance against the victims, motivated mainly by the desire to frighten and distress the victim. Intimacy seekers seek to establish an intimate, loving relationship with their victim. Such stalkers often believe that the victim is a long sought after soulmate and they are meant to be together. Incompetent suitors, despite poor social or courting skills, have a fixation or in some cases a sense of entitlement to an intimate relationship with those who have attracted their amorous interest. Their victims are most often already in a dating relationship with someone else. Predatory stalkers spy on the victim in order to prepare and plan an attack, often sexual, on the victim. The 2002 National Victim Association Academy defines an additional form of stalking, 
the Vengeance slash Terrorist Stalker. Both the Vengeance Stalker and the Terrorist Stalker, the latter sometimes called the Political Stalker, do not in contrast with some of the aforementioned types of stalkers seek a personal relationship with their victims but rather force them to admit a certain response. While the vengeance stalker's motive is to get even with the other person whom he or she perceives has done them wrong, for example, an employee, the political stalker intends to accomplish a political agenda, also using threats and intimidation to force the target to refrain or become involved in some particular activity, regardless of the victim's consent. For example, most prosecutions in this stalking category have been against anti-abortionists who stalk doctors in an attempt to discourage the performance of abortions. With the meteoric rise of technology in the past 20 years, cyberstalking has arguably become one of the most common but can be just as devastating, and there's been many unfortunate situations over the past few years. Linked to cyberstalking is cyberbullying, and one can argue that they are similar, if not the same. Many kids in school have committed suicide as a result of constant bullying at school that had spilled over into cyberbullying. With the barrage of abuse being almost a 24 hour thing for the victim, the psychological abuse endured can be nothing short of horrendous. There is also stalking by groups, or gang stalking. Research conducted by the US Department of Justice indicates that this type of stalking occurs in work environments, as well as fraternities and sororities. A significant number of people reporting stalking incidents claim that they had been stalked by more than one person, with 18.2% reporting that they were stalked by two people and 13.1% reporting that they had been stalked by three or more. According to a United Kingdom study by Sheridan and Boone, in 5% of the cases they studied, there was more than one stalker, and 40% of the victims said that friends or family of their stalker had also been involved. In 15% of cases, the victim was unaware of any reason for the harassment. Over a quarter of all stalking and harassment victims did not know their stalkers in any capacity. About a tenth responding to surveys did not know the identities of their stalkers. 11% of victims said that they had been stalked for five years or even more. How many of you know the name Linda Goff or Sarah Marslin? I bet you will have heard of their murderers though, Fred West and Harold Shipman. Hi everybody, this is Steve, the host of True Crime Fix, the podcast which gives the story whilst giving the victim the loudest voice of them all. So far we've covered cases such as Coletta Ram, Kitty Genovese, Jackie Paul, JC Sawyer and Molly McLaren. I'll be releasing new episodes every other Friday via Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify and all other available stations. So please come over and subscribe and give my podcast a listen. I really hope that you find these episodes informative. If you would like further information, please follow me on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod or find me on Facebook, True Crime Fix Podcast. And remember, stay safe, look after each other and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone. There is absolutely no doubt stalking is a terrifying criminal act which gives out prolonged acts of abuse in many different forms. With most criminal acts, it is men who commit the crimes. But stalking is perhaps the crime where there's a similar balance between men and women as to who is offending. And with that being said, this case shows that women can just as easily go to the worst extremes 
as some men quite often do. In the early 2000s, Dr. Jan Falkowski seemed to have it all. In his professional life, he was a respected psychiatrist working within the UK's national health system and was based at St. Clement's Hospital in Bow, East London. In his personal life, he was a powerboating champion and even met his soon-to-be fiancée, Debbie Pemberton, at a powerboat race in 2001. At this time, Falkowski was 41 and Pemberton a few years his junior. Jan, who was publicly schooled, worked very hard to earn his title of doctor. With his good looks and sophisticated dress sense, along with his powerboating background, he had his admirers. Debbie was attracted and the pair started their courtship and were for a time very happy. Jan lived in a boathouse in London, while Debbie lived in a flat in the beautiful coastal town of Poole in Dorset, not too far from Bournemouth. This part of the country is well known for its large natural harbour, sandy beaches and old Georgian houses. The couple split their time living between Jan's boathouse in London, as well as his other home in Epsom and Surrey, but spending the majority of the weekends down at Debbie's place in Poole. Things were sweet for the pair, and they soon got engaged setting the wedding date for the 6th of September 2003. But it was some 13 months before their special day that things would start to take a sinister turn. While the pair were on the train together, Debbie received a phone call from a woman with a Spanish accent. The caller asked Debbie to confirm her name before hanging up the call. Thinking it was nothing more than a telemarketer, Debbie and Jan continued on with their journey. However, just a few minutes later, Jan received a text message to his phone that said, quote, I know where you park your car at the hospital. Jan and Debbie ignored the message, chalking it down to be nothing more than a prank caller. But within a few more minutes, more messages along the same lines flooded through into their phones. The pair attempted to call the number, but the call couldn't connect through. On the 25th of October 2002, Jan and Debbie received calls on their mobile phones while they were driving down to stay at Debbie's flat in Poole. The calls were threatening and they were made by both a man and a woman. Jan also received anonymous texts which included the words, quote, You will never know how much I feel for you in the last four years. Jan and Debbie thought enough of the messages to make a complaint to the police in Dorset, who in turn mentioned there wasn't much they could do at this point, but urged the couple to save the messages and keep them apprised of any further communications they received. As was later found out, the messages were rerouted through a computer in Sweden, making it impossible to trace. The calls and messages continued. The calls were silent calls, with no one talking on the other end of the phone, and the texts soon began to get more abusive, as it became clear that the obsession was Jan himself. While much of Jan's messages he received were complimentary and of somewhat of a loving nature, Debbie got nothing but bile and abuse, with one such message reading, quote, You will burn in your wedding dress. Debbie was under no illusions that this was the workings of a jealous love rival and understandably became scared and paranoid. She was right to trust her instincts. On October 28, 2002, the pair would return to Jan's boathouse after their weekend in pool, only to find the lights of the boathouse had been turned on. Debbie knew she had turned the lights off, but Jan wasn't as concerned as the person would have had to have somehow bypassed the marina's security gate. 
Nevertheless, the police were brought in and they dusted for prints but found nothing of use. Just two days later, after the pair returned to the boat after a night at the pub, they got a major shock. Jan stepped onto the boat first before screaming to Debbie that the gas tap to the stove had been left on. Gas had filled the boathouse and all it would have taken was an electrical spark to blow the place, Jan and Debbie up. Police were to take further notice now as a serious attempt to harm the couple had been made. Elizabeth Mills, who was the lock keeper at the marina at the time, informed police that a woman of Mediterranean appearance had attempted to enter the secure area of the marina stating that she had a dinner invitation from Jan. In between the two boat incidents, the text continued. Debbie would get multiple messages telling her that she wasn't good enough for Jan, and the texter started to call her, fucking Debbie Tart. Police instructed the pair to keep the communications received strictly between Jan, Debbie and the police, as police were sure the stalker was somebody they knew. The stalker gloatingly revealed they knew the weekly routine of the pair in terms of travel routines and even that Debbie would catch the train from London Waterloo Station when she was going home. The pair returned to the police to give them an update on the messages further received and they were advised to change their numbers, but they denied this not wanting to seemingly give in to someone with a sick agenda. Instead, they decided to put a block on their phones so that any blocked calls or texts can go through to their phones. Up to this point, Debbie was receiving around 10 threats per day, saying things like, quote, A bullet waiting for you, gunman paid, and one that simply read, You be dead. The stalker also went on about harassing Debbie at her workplace. Debbie worked at Debenhams, an upper market department store, and on a regular basis this mysterious person would call her department. When the stalker got through to Debbie's colleagues, she would demand to talk to Debbie. When this demand was refused, she would unleash abuse on the colleague. She also learned that Debenhams was involved in a multi-million pound takeover and phoned the chief executive of the company, telling him that Debbie had leaked sensitive financial information to the press. As January 2003 came around, police made a bold suggestion to Jan and Debbie. They urged the couple to move into a secret safe house where only the police, Jan and Debbie, would know the location. Cracks were beginning to appear in their relationship. The more Debbie struggled with the constant abuse, the more Jan seemed to pull away from his fiancée, seemingly disappointed at her lack of ability to cope with the situation. The abuse didn't stop, and the stalker went on about doing everything in her power to sabotage the couple's big day their wedding. On a few occasions leading up to the big day, Debbie would ring ahead to the hotel where the reception was being held so she could go over some arrangements for what was meant to be the happiest day of her life, the day she had dreamed of. To her horror, when she called the venue, she was informed by the organiser that the wedding had been cancelled. Totally confused by this, Debbie then quickly realised that it had been this crazed person stalking them that had called the hotel and cancelled the wedding plans. The stalker also managed to obtain the hotel chef's phone number and threatened to poison the guests. This made Debbie and the hotel organisers take steps of employing a secret password when it came to discussions and decisions on the wedding. Jan and Debbie needed a break away, so they booked a weekend in Brussels, but somehow, the stalker found out about this trip, sending Debbie a chilling text saying, quote, 
you can't run away for the weekend. This understandably spooked the hell out of the couple as they hadn't told anyone of the trip and had only discussed it together while on Jan's boat. The resourceful stalker also somehow managed to find out that Debbie had planned to get her teeth whitened in preparation for a wedding, sending her a message saying, quote, Debbie Tart fancied whitening her teeth. Her mouth could burn. This convinced Debbie and Jan that their properties were bugged and they swept the areas looking for the evidence that would confirm their suspicions, but they found nothing. As the wedding was fast approaching, the abuse seemed to worsen as the stalker seemed to want to pull out all the stops to make sure the wedding wouldn't go ahead. A couple of further messages to Debbie read, quote, Bang, bang, bang. That's all you deserve. Fucking Debbie Tart. Your last days are counted up. And, quote, You will be burnt down in your wedding dress. Jan was also still receiving messages. He got ones telling him, quote, Not to marry that fucking witch and another even desperately telling him that Debbie was having an affair. Progress was at last being made by the police. They discovered that all of the calls, texts and emails were being sent through public call boxes. Many, if not most of the public payphones back at this time, had a miniature keyboard underneath the numerical keypad of the phone, so this enabled the user to send texts and emails. Police eventually worked this out, and through further investigations traced many of the numbers to call boxes located in Dorset and in various areas of London. Despite progress being made on the police front, it became too much for Jan and Debbie's relationship, which crumbled under the weight of everything. The pair parted and were to call off the wedding, but police had other ideas in mind. They had a plan. Hey friends of the show, sorry for a pause in the story, but just a quick reminder to let you know how you can help support the show by becoming a patron. Head on over to patreon.com slash Grapple. and for a dollar US a month, you can get a shout out on the show with the Assault Tier. For five bucks a month, there is the murder tier, where we'll have early episodes up every so often and we'll have some bonus content coming your way. So check it out. That's patreon.com slash truecrimegrapple. Any donation is greatly appreciated and welcomed. Once again, patreon.com slash truecrimegrapple. Many thanks. Knowing that the stalker knew the date of the upcoming wedding, police banked on the stalker calling Debbie on the day of the wedding to give her further abuse in a last-ditch attempt to scare her out of marrying Jan. What the stalker didn't know is that Jan and Debbie had secretly cancelled their wedding after splitting up, but in an attempt with the police to smoke the stalker out, had kept the illusion of the wedding going ahead. Instead of guests at the venue, it was to be undercover police. September 6, 2003 arrived, the day of the wedding. Debbie sat in her parents' house alongside two police officers, while the other officers were at the venue keeping watch and some in a police control room keeping communication. There were also officers in cars in and around pool. Everyone was all hands on deck to execute the sting operation. The plan was to wait for the stalker to get in contact with Debbie, believing she'd do so from one of the local public payphones. Police would then trace the call and throw into action the detectives out in the cars so they could hopefully get to that call box and arrest the perpetrator. Instead, however... The stalker ran Debbie's flat where her lodger was in waiting with the police. 
abuse was hurled down the line before the call was ended with the police unable to get a trace. But at around 12.30pm, they finally struck gold. The phone rang again and a trace was found to a local phone box in town. This time, there was no getting away. Police were luckily in the area and rushed to the location. It was there they caught and arrested the mysterious person who had made life misery for Jan and Debbie for so long. Police took her in and booked her. Her name was Maria Marchese. Neither Debbie Pemberton or Jan Falkowski recognised the name Maria Marchese when the police informed them of the identity of the woman that had made their lives hell for the last year. As it turned out, Marchese wasn't Spanish but in fact Argentinian and had been living in England for some years having eventually become a citizen. She was 45 years old at the time of her arrest and worked as a shop assistant. She was taken in for questioning as police were keen to learn about her obsession with Dr. Falkowski. Back in 1997, Marchese was in a relationship with a man by the name of George Attard, who had a history of psychiatric illness. George Attard began treatment at St Clement's Hospital in East London, where he saw consultant psychiatrist Dr Jan Falkowski for about 30 minutes every two to three months. It was during these appointments that Marchese would accompany George. Despite having very little interaction with Jan, she became utterly besotted with him. Police believed Marchese found out about Jan and Debbie's relationship through the National Health Service magazine, which was available to patients. The magazine had published an announcement about their engagement. Police, of course, set about laying charges. They believed they had Marchese dead to rights. They even searched her flat and found a shrine of pictures full of Jan Falkowski. Once Jan learned of the connection between Marchese and his patient, he ceased treatment with the patient, to which Marchese then made a complaint to the hospital. Not long after this, Debbie discovered Jan had started a new relationship with a woman called Bethan Ansel. She and Jan parted ways, and Jan, thinking they could go back to some sort of normality, tried to move on with his new love. On the 8th of December 2003, the Crown Prosecution Service informed Maria Marchese that it had decided not to pursue the charges that the police had brought. No explanation has been given for this unbelievable decision. Shortly after this, Jan received a threatening phone call. Both he and his secretary recognised the voice of the caller. It was Marchese. Jan quickly reported the matter to the police. On the 31st of December 2003, Debbie's flat and pool was entered into by an unknown person. Nothing was taken, but the lights were left on, windows left open, and objects were moved around. Police believed that keys had been used to gain entry to the flat. Of course, police suspected Marchese and re-arrested her on January 21st, 2004. It was during this police interview that Marchese took things to a new, depraved depth. She went on to file a report with the police stating that Dr. Falkowski had drugged and raped her at his medical practice. Between April 22, 2002 and June 19 of the same year, Marchese's former partner, George Attard, had been admitted as a voluntary inpatient at St. Clement's Hospital, where Jan had worked. 
She claimed that the rape took place one day in June while she was visiting George, but she couldn't give an exact date of the alleged crime. She also told police she had the smoking gun to prove it. Evidence. Evidence that proved beyond doubt that Jan Falkowski had raped her. Police collected the evidence, a pair of Marchese's underwear, which she said had Falkowski's semen on them. Police then took them away and were quick to have Jan come in for questioning. They then charged him with the drugging and rape of Maria Marchese, despite Jan's pleas of his innocence. This was the first time Marchese had made any such claims of rape against Jan Falkowski. For 18 months, Jan lived under the suspicion of being a rapist. His reputation was destroyed and his life went from terrible to worse. But once again, there was a twist. Days before he was due at the Old Bailey for his court date, his lawyers came through with some new evidence. Ironically, it was from the very same evidence or smoking gun that looked to lock him up for many years. It was determined a third DNA sample was found on the underwear. The DNA was that of Jan's girlfriend, Beth Ansel. Jan surmised that Marchese had rummaged through his rubbish and obtained a used condom and emptied the contents onto her underwear, but unknowingly transferred Ansel's DNA on there too. Furthermore, it was established that Jan never knew his girlfriend Bethan at the time Marchese alleged the rape had took place. Crown Prosecution Service lawyer Kay Scudder had no choice but to recommend to the court that the case was dropped, and it was. Jan was a free man, and his name was finally cleared. Marchese was irate at that decision, and soon turned her venom onto Kay Scudder and many of her colleagues sending threatening calls. Scudder came out after the ordeal and said, Quote, I was seriously concerned at what she was capable of. She was a determined woman. Miss Scudder was bombarded with telephone calls from Marchese, demanding that she reinstate the case. The stalker even turned up at CPS headquarters in Ludgate Hill, forcing Miss Scudder to sneak out the back door. The CPS which had been criticised for prosecuting Dr. Falkowski, paid for CCTV cameras, an alarm and a fireproof letterbox to be installed at Miss Scudder's home in Bromley. She said, quote, They reinforced my bedroom door and installed a panic button straight through to the police station. They turned my bedroom into a panic room so that if she got into the house, I could flee there and it would withstand the attack for long enough for the police to arrive. I was frightened until she was finally charged. I would get different trains to work, walk different routes, wear casual clothing, that sort of thing. I thought it was unlikely it would be a physical attack, but I didn't exclude the possibility she might burn down my flat. Every time I came home, I didn't know if it would be burned to the ground or if there would be blood or graffiti over the front door. I wasn't going to bed until 2am. I kept hearing noises. I was absolutely paranoid. The Crown then had Marchese taken to court. Her case lasted three weeks and once it was done, Maria Marchese was found guilty on charges of perverting the course of justice as well as the charges being reopened for the offences previously committed against Jan and Debbie. So she was also charged with harassment and threats to kill. Debbie Pemberton was called to give evidence at the court hearing and recalls Marchese showing no remorse or showing any emotion. 
A psychiatric report concluded that Marchese did not suffer any mental illness such that a mental health disposal would be appropriate. She continued to present a risk towards others, particularly men with whom she had wished to form a relationship. Furthermore, the court saw Marchese's personality as exceptionally devious and continued to see herself as the true victim in all of it. On January 19, 2007, Judge John Price slapped a nine-year sentence on Marchese, sending out a message to stalkers and those who harass and falsely cry rape. She also had a lifetime restraining order put against her for Jan and Debbie, as well as some 40 other people she had harassed in connection with the case. It was a landmark decision. In sentencing, the judge said, quote, What you did to those two was dreadfully painful, dreadfully hard, and caused them enormous suffering. It is difficult to imagine a more serious case. Maria Marchese's behaviour had changed her victims' lives forever. Debbie Pemberton lost weight, saw her health deteriorate and contemplated suicide. Jan Falkowski had his name dragged through the mud and his reputation tarnished so badly that his practice suffered greatly. Outside court, a spokeswoman for the Crown Prosecution Service said, quote, Maria Marchese is a dangerous individual who wreaked havoc in the lives of those she singled out for victimisation. We are pleased with the sentence and believe it sends a message to those who seek to act similarly. After the case, it was revealed that Marchese had history, having stalked a couple some years before. Dating back to 1990, Marchese became obsessed with another man and began stalking him and his wife. In February 1992, she was arrested and charged with threatening behaviour against the pair. In August 1992, Marchese accuses the male of attacking her with a knife and brings civil action against him at Westminster County Court. The case was then dropped. In 1996, Marchese was given an official warning by police after threatening to kidnap the baby of the couple she stalked. April 2000 after continued harassment of the baby's parents and Marchese was bound over to keep the peace for 12 months, basically to keep her distance. Notice that last date of April 2000. By this time, she had already known her next victim, Jan Valkowski. In 2009, the TV movie called You Be Dead, which was based on the true events of this story, was firstly aired on New Zealand TV and subsequently the UK and Australia. You can find it on YouTube. It starred respected British actor David Morrissey playing Dr Jan Valkowski and Monica Dolan playing the twisted Maria Marchese who she was made up to look strikingly similar to. Since Marchese was sentenced and put to prison, both Jan and Debbie went on to share their horror story with various media outlets in a bid to bring awareness on stalking. Debbie has since married and reportedly moved out of the UK, spending time in France and Australia. Jan is still going on the power boats. In fact, he is the co-skipper of a multi-million pound team led by Alan Priddy in a bid to break a world record. Jan himself, still holding seven world records, hopes to hold another by being part of a team to design and build the fastest, most fuel-efficient wave-slicing power boat 
to circumnavigate the globe for the much coveted UIM world record. New Zealander Pete Boothane currently holds the record at 60 days, 23 hours and 49 minutes. The Team Britannia is scheduled to set sail sometime in the near future, with the route set to start in Gibraltar, with the craft having to pass through the Suez and Panama canals, cross the Tropic of Cancer and the Equator, and finally finishing up where it started off, back in Gibraltar. So what about Maria Marchese? Well, much digging was done to find out just where she is right now, but the truth is, this narrator isn't sure. Having spent hours trawling through the internet, I could find no public information about her release, if in fact she is out. Having got a nine-year sentence in 2007, if she'd served the entire nine, she would have been out by 2016. Chances are, she might have got an early release, but I for one could not find any sort of press release to confirm. Maria Marchese may well be out walking amongst us, and if she is, then she's doing just as good a job of keeping a stealth profile, just as she did for much of her stalking of Jan Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton. And that is a scary thought. That is going to wrap things up for this week's show. Maria Marchese is now in the books. Another crazy story from the world of true crime. This is one of them stories that without doubt makes you see people in a whole different and dark light. You just never, never know with some people. Till next time, I've been your host Dan and please, please stay safe out there.